Anybody have an idea of what is language actually? Language. I like that one. Anybody else want to um, add to that? It's pretty, the tools you use to communicate. It's pretty well rounded. So language is made of socially shared rules including the following. So semantic, what words mean? How to make new words, morphology. So friend becomes friendly or kind become, becomes, you can, how you change a word to become something else or to mean something else. So he is kind, she's kinder, she's the kindest person I've ever met in that sense. So morphology, that's all language. How do we change the words to really express what we mean? How do we put these things together? That's syntax, grammar, not, you know, how do we put these things together? I went to the beach yesterday and not I went to the beach today. That is also in the development of language. And then word combination, what words best? So. If you want to speak to your elder you, and they're stepping on your foot, instead of cutting them off and say, move your foot, you'll say, can you please move your foot? Or when speaking to someone else that is maybe younger and you're trying to make them listen to you right now, you're like, listen to me. And not when you're talking to your mother, you're like, listen to me. Because if you talk to your mother like that, what's going to happen? Right? I remember when I was younger that I did that with my mom. That didn't end well. I'm just saying. So that is what happens. You, that's language. It's knowing what to say, what it means, how to put it together, and really knowing how to say it in when, in what situation. How do I say this in this situation? Yeah? And let's figure. And then the question is now, one, <laughs> my mom is telling me to slow down so if I am talking too fast please let me know what is normal what is normal language development now I call it normal because every child is unique and every child develops in their own space in their own time so what is written here is not necessarily what's going to happen with your child but these are the parameters and what we use to say well okay this is kind of normal so when your child is one we expect to hear one word sentences mom ball that give mine the favorite one mine right those, that's what we expect to hear. We expect to hear this, but we do also expect them to understand, go there, take that. This is between two and three years, sorry. I was talking about one year old. Two and three years, then we're expecting them to start developing more. So I want my toy, don't do, two word sentences. Three to four years old, that is going to broaden. Three to four, so what we're looking for three to four sentences. Give me that. The ball deal. And that develops with time. We also expect them to know, understand colors now. We expect them to say, well, this is my brother. Opa, Oma. Mama, they learn family relations. That's what you're expecting at this age. And then when they're talking, what's that? Who da? Those questions, you hear them coming, right? You feel them, you, you see it then happening. 
three to five. Now we're a little older, right? So now they're talking in basically full sentences. They're like little persons. All of a sudden they got a bunch of chat. They're talking your head off, right? For those with normally developing children, normally, this is what the situation is, right? I'm talking your head off, the understanding time, like yesterday, tomorrow. So before they didn't understand what that meant. And they always like, and you see them making those mistakes. Like I have a four year old and she's there talking about today we did this, but she said yesterday, you know? But she meant this morning, we were playing with the teacher and we did that. And then she was like, but yesterday we do this. And then as you see them develop, you'll notice that time becomes relevant. They understand they're no longer living in the here and now. Today, 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 everything is now, okay, yesterday or tomorrow I'm going to do that. Your body following me so far? So I'm not gonna go too deep into this. This information I have written um, on the table for you. So if you want, you can come take a sheet and go. So I'm, I said, I'm gonna go and jump straight over to teenagers because between five and 10, what you'll notice is that between zero and one, the basis of communication is set. And five and 10, five, 11, then you'll see them growing. The, the sentences will be growing. They'll be more eloquent. They'll be able to express themselves easier, but you won't see any real big change. The basis is between zero and five, yeah? So now let's jump a couple of years ahead. Teenagers, for those of you who have teenagers, anybody have teenagers? Do you have a teenage son? Okay. So now teenagers, they're speaking in, if everything is well with their development, they're speaking in full sentences, they're even giving you some mouth, right? My mother could tell you. So, but they also understand figurative language. They understand, they're now understanding abstract language so that a word doesn't necessarily mean what you say it. Um, anybody can give me an idiom, because I can't think of one right now. A gezegde. Een ezel stoot sinds voet geen twee keer op dezelfde steen, zeg maar. But I know that one in Dutch. Anyone knows an English one that you would like to share with the group? Long row for maga good. Now, a child between five and ten will be like, long row for maga good. They're going to look for this maga good and this rope. But now we're teenagers. We're starting to understand that that doesn't necessarily mean that. What does that mean, actually? Because I'm not even sure. <laughs> <laughs> it means you're going to get so many chances and after that you're going to hang yourself yeah. you see figurative language now I didn't know that one but I do know that, that it didn't necessarily mean that and teenagers are now in the stage where they're going to understand that lang the words that we're using at this point in time may not necessarily mean that there's an actual rope for a goat Their sentences, their syntax, their grammar in speech as well as written is longer. They understand punctuation. They're, su they're supposed to. Now, a lot of our teenagers, I'm noticing they're having problems with this. But that is a whole diff that's more to do with our culture than anything else. Because we use the punctu the way we speak as a simatinas is a little, we put punctuation a little different than someone from the UK or someone from the US. It's just a little different. So you have to take certain things into consideration when it comes to our teenagers. But, and then they understand that and produce so that language is social. So now we're not no longer just using language as a mean to just say and express what we mean, but I know if I say something that that can hurt you. So I can say it in such a way that I know it's going to hurt you. Now I really understand that I'm using this language to either hurt you, to make you happy, or to say like, 
or I, they use it to bully. You know, there are certain teens that use language to bully. They do it online. Or they're, so they really now use this language as social. But they also say, well, I really like you. They understand the true essence of what language is. Communicating our ideas, our feelings, our wants, and our needs to another person. Be it verbally or non-verbally. Yeah? All right, this is a big question. Learning two languages, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Anybody can tell me? I can't hear you. Oh, you heard that? Who else here thinks that learning more than one language is a good thing? Why? You think so, but why? You raise your hand too, right? Why do you think that language, learning two languages is a good thing? Sorry? It's your mark as a I mean, in the long run. And plus it does something to your brain where you're able to, to switch languages. And no, um, she's, she's yeah. saying it. The the correct term is, and, and I know it in Dutch, and I'm so sorry, is metalinguista bewustzijn. It's understanding that language can interchange from one to the next. That you learn, when you learn from a very young age, two different languages or more, you are, you quicker understand that language is ever living, it's flowing. People who only learn one language don't have that that quickly. They don't. So it's a good thing. It's a very good thing. So if you do want to teach your children to speak a different language, please do. However, if they are showing problems in one language, and I'm saying that because I'm seeing a mother like with, that's not what you told me, because that's <laughs> very true. If, she is, if a child is already showing a disability in development, then it's better to use the language that is most spoken at home. You want a good basis, a proper basis for the language. Yeah? Now, every bilingual child is unique. So the growth, so the development of this is going to be different than everybody else. One child is always different than the next, right? So what you'll notice is this, that the development of milestones, so when we start one year, we use one word sentences, two years, two word sentences, three years, three word sentences, that is pretty typically normal, like, one children are growing up with one language, right? You also notice that they might mix the rules faster for a short period of time. This doesn't last forever, but that's because they're now putting together, f okay, this is Dutch, this is English, and then you'll notice that they might start a sentence in Dutch, but finish it in English. I mean, I still do that, I don't know about anybody else. Or they might mix the rules. So like in Dutch, you have the, the TD words, ik, or ik ben, I am. They might mix those things up also. But this is for a short period. That's because they're now learning the language. It's not an issue. This is OK at a young age. It becomes not OK after seven. Long period to be able to learn the two languages, right? So don't run and be like, when my child is learning a second language quick, it's because it's taking time. It takes time to develop. But they understand the, the modus of language easier. You'll see a better flow. Some children, and this you see also, is like, my child learning a new sense of language, but they ain't talking. This is the silent period. This is children, some children tend to incubate. Listen first, take it in process and then they start speaking. It can start, last for two weeks, 
to several months. But it's not any reason to run panicking, especially when you're raising your child bilingual, in a bilingual home. My suggestion, and I'm doing this now, is because I'm not gonna come back on this um, topic, is when you're teaching your child a, a new language, or if you want to teach your child two languages, you always start at home with the two languages. So if your husband speaks English and you speak Dutch or Spanish, then keep them separate. You always, the ladies always speak Spanish to your child, gentlemen, you always speak English to your child. And that child will then, at that moment, understand well developing that, hey, this is one language, mommy's speaking one language, and daddy's speaking the next. I have a friend in here who does that with her children, and she told me recently, but my child would come to me and speak in Dutch and turn to my husband and speak in English. And that is really good. There's nothing wrong with that. At one point, it will synergize and the child will be able to do English and Dutch to both because they will understand, hey, it's just a language. Daddy understands another language too. But it will be embedded in them. Start from young. There's no problem with that. Yeah? Now, now let's get to the fun stuff. Language disorders. There is three parts in language, receptive, expressive, and mixed, like in language disorders. Receptive means that they don't always understand the instructions given. So you'll be talking to your, your son or daughter, and you're like, go pick this up and put this there. And then they will go pick it up and put it down next to them and walk off because they've totally forgotten or didn't understand the last part of the sentence. Now we have expressive. This one is the more easier one of the two to realize. You'll notice that your child would be sitting down there and he's four, six years old. He's supposed to be able to give full sentences and he's just, you know, saying maybe one or two, three words per sentence. He's slow, he's always like, um, um, looking for the words to express what he means, can't remember that this was a bottle. You taught him that this was a bottle yesterday and he doesn't remember that it was a bottle. The bottle, it has a cover. The cover you can turn, turn, and the person just, sorry, it worked. But that was not the idea of the cover of the bottle. And then you're like, turn, pull. No, turn, pull. Mixing up words. Not putting words in the right context. This is all, all expressive dis um, exp language, expressive language disorder. Not the inability to express your thoughts, your ideas. You want to go to the bathroom. You've seen it right there. You can see the picture of the bathroom and you say, I need to go. I need to go. Kitchen. Now you take the child to the kitchen and the child scream out, no, this is not what I want because he never really understood the word bathroom. And then he pee himself and you're wondering, but, but this ain't what this place is used for. So, he says something, but doesn't mean what he say at that point in time. Not understanding what the words mean, to, and not the inability to have a vocabulary that is broad enough to be able to express what you mean. And a lot of children have mixed. So they don't understand, but they don't, they're not able to express themselves. Most children have a combination of the both. What causes these language disorders? Now, the truth of the matter is, we don't always know what causes language disorders. We assume that it could be from the genes, that it's hereditary. Your parents aren't that, weren't that um, fluent in language. They had some issues growing up. We, you, we think that that could be a reason, or that 
the prenatal nutrition, that the child wasn't getting enough nutrition, they didn't grow well enough in the stomach. That could also be a situation, a reason why um, there's developmental issues. And other conditions, usually language disorders, language, it doesn't have to be, but a lot of language disorders are connected with another disability. So think of autism, Down syndrome, born, born premature, then you have a, automatically a language delay, and other intellectual disabilities. Yeah? Any questions so far? I know someone has a burning question. I can feel it. <laughs> Was I that clear? Okay, no. Especially when young, yes. Yes. Now, realistically, in Samantha, we have a lot of children who are speaking maybe a language at home. Yeah. Um, let's just give an example Spanish. Yeah. They only get Spanish at home, yet they attend a Dutch school, for example, and with their peers, they speak English. English. So, what recommendations can you give in those cases? Because you see that those children are not mastering sometimes. None of the three languages. But you have the question then for me first of all is their primary language which is then Spanish. How how did they master that? Because if they didn't master the, 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 the mastery comes in their primary language. And if they didn't master the basic language, then they'll have a lot of trouble mastering any other language. Because they didn't have that basis. So first, the first question is, how is that at home? Is mom trying to speak English to the child so the child can learn English? What else is going on with that child? Because a lot of the times we forget that at home they might not be, you know, enforcing that communication that you would like. So they want to talk all different languages but not master English and then talk to their child in that English, broken English language so that child won't understand that. So that's the first question. Then I would say, if the child is not mastering anything, take the one that is most foreign, which is then out, which is Dutch. He is going to learn the English because English is something that we hear all around us in St. Martin. So I would say if, a child, if you see a child is struggling in both languages, Spanish and English and Dutch, take the child out of the Dutch school, put him in the English school, because then at the very least, he'll get only two languages and one of which where he can master. And then reinforce at home that they speak only Spanish. Yeah? That's a really good question. Anybody else? You had a question? Burning question, I know, ask, please. Yeah. Well, to me. Mm -hmm. But I realize he's having an issue with pronouncing S. Oh, well, that's coming. Okay. <laughs> that's coming. We only, I took, I, I did that purposely. I took a part speech and language. Because okay. we're dealing with language first, development, what are we supposed to be saying when and how? And now, well, what are we supposed to be saying? And now we're going to go into the how. How are we producing the sounds? Yeah? Now let's go into that right away. What is speech? Can anyone tell me? I am so curious. I know you guys know what is speech. Come on. You guys just sitting. Hello. Good morning. Everybody tell you I will make you do exercises. Articulation. Articulation. What else? Verbal expression. Verbal expression. But that's verbal expression is the speech we use is to how we express verbally. What is speech itself? We break it down. Sounds. Sounds. Pronunciation. Pronunciation. Speech is a means of verbal communication. So that's what we do. We express ourselves verbally through our speech. Consists out of articulation, voice, how our vocal cords move to make, create the sound, right? Fluency, the rhythm. 
oh, go back. And they're missing one here, breath. We, we need oh, the air to be able to produce the sound so that our breathing moves the vocal cords, the vocal cords move up and down, that creates the sound, our tongue moves in our mouth, our cheeks move, our jaw open and flaps, that creates the sounds, that, that for faint, the sounds, and then we have words. Think about it. Break down the word that. What do you have to do with your tongue? No, let's go, wait, hold on, bring that back. Let's do dog. Dog. That's a little easier to think about. Dog. What happens with your tongue? What happens with your breath? What do you feel? Dog. It is in the combination of all these factors is how we create our speech. Duh. Duh. The duh alone, I need to start moving my stomach to bring the air forward so that it can move my vocal cords. Duh. And then the air comes out in an explosive. Duh. For the D for dog. And then we have to put other sounds together to make a word. Can you imagine how difficult that is? You don't sit still and think about it because this comes naturally to us. Our body, our mind, it's a beautiful thing. We learn this by repetition. We hear our parents do it, so we did it. We saw them do it, so we did it. And that's the same for your kids, right? All right, unfortunately, I don't think you can see it that well, but this is the speech development chart. So at two, we expect a child to be able to say in the beginning words, initially a B, D, H, M, D sums. At three, T, G, K, T and W, B, at four, Q, at five, Ch. And only later down for your question, six is the S.